Okay, so there are a variety of different ways to prepare amines. What I want to do first is go over review, meaning looking at reactions we've already covered, and then we'll cover new ways that um, we can make amines that are in this chapter. So let's do review first. The first way we can make an amine is via a substitution reaction. So let's say we have uh, a compound with a good leaving group. What we can do is we can treat this with sodium cyanide, right? And in this case, cyanide is a decent nucleophile. So it can do an SN2 attack and it can kick off our nucleophile, right? So really basic SN2 chemistry. And then when we do that, we now have a nitrile group installed. And if you remember from our chapter on carboxylic acid derivatives, we can reduce that nitrile group, meaning go from a triple bond to a single bond by treating it with lithium aluminum hydride in excess, followed by a quench with water. And when we do that, we're actually able to make a primary amine. The one thing that students always forget about when they do this reaction is because we're reacting with cyanide, we're going to be left with an extra carbon at the end. So it is important to remember that this is useful if you want to gain a carbon, but it's not very useful if you want to stick with your same number of carbons in your starting material. So let's make a note here that we gained a carbon. All right, another method that we saw in the carboxylic acid chapter was with our amides. In fact, we saw a similar reaction with amides where we can take LAH and then quench with water. And when we do this, whoops, we're going to remove that CO double bond and we're going to be left with a primary amine. And just to do a little bit more review, we can actually go from a carboxylic acid to our uh, amide by first treating it with thionyl chloride, so SOCl2, followed by ammonia and excess. So really, this is a nice way to convert directly from a carboxylic acid straight to your amine. All right, we also saw how to make amines from aromatic molecules. Specifically, if we start with benzene, we can't just add on an NH2 group directly. However, what we can do is we can nitrate it using nitric acid and sulfuric acid to make nitrobenzene. And then once we have nitrobenzene, we can convert that NO2 group into an NH2 group by reducing it and thereby making aniline. And to do this reduction, we normally need some sort of metal. It's going to be iron or zinc, typically, and hydrochloric acid. And that will reduce us to aniline. So that's a useful way for making aromatic amines. This doesn't really work well for non-aromatic molecules. Um, so we're just going to stick with this as being our primary route for making aromatic amines. All right. But as you can see, all of these amines that I've shown are not substituted, right? So they're all considered primary amines. They're all amines that are attached at one carbon. So let's take a look at how we could theoretically prepare substituted amines. And this isn't the greatest approach, but we'll take a look at the problems here in a second. So prep of substituted amines. All right, so let's say we have ammonia and we wanna just kind of build off of ammonia. And we know that ammonia is a pretty good nucleophile. It's got that lone pair. So let's say we react this with methyl iodide. Well, we could do a SN2 substitution reaction and we could, in theory, get this methyl group installed that would leave the nitrogen with a positive charge, right? And we would have our leaving group that was kicked off, iodide. And typically when this happens, you would have some unreacted starting material floating around, meaning unreacted ammonia. And this ammonia could help facilitate the deprotonation of this intermediate. 
And by doing this reaction, we should be able to make methylamine, right? Along with ammonium salts. However, the main pitfall with this is it is very hard to stop here. And what I mean by that is as soon as you make this, it's going to find some unreacted methyl iodide and oftentimes run out of control, meaning it's just going to keep on reacting with as much methyl iodide as it can find. And what we'll make is a quaternary ammonium salt where it just exhaustively alkylates that amine. And iodide would be the counter anion. And like I said, this is called a quaternary ammonium salt. So this SN2 technique is only really good if you want the quaternary ammonium salt. It's not very good if you want to stop at a primary, secondary, or a tertiary amine. So we'll make a note down here that this method is messy, meaning it is not good for making primary, secondary, or tertiary amines. It kind of runs out of control. Like I said, it's just going to find any st uh, starting alkyl halide, and it's going to uh, alkylate really, really fast. One thing I did want to briefly talk about is when we covered SN2 chemistry, we saw reagents like methyl iodide a lot. One problem with using these reagents in a lab setting is that they will react with nitrogen, right? And it will do this alkylation chemistry that I just showed you. The problem is we have a lot of nitrogen compounds inside of our body, right? You think about um, a lot of our amino acids and things like that, there's nitrogens in there. And so if we are working with this as a chemist, we can actually accidentally alkylate the nitrogen compounds in our body. And when that happens, gene regulation gets messed up and these compounds, like methyl iodide, are notoriously harmful. They can cause cancer if you're exposed to them in a large amount. So more and more chemists are trying to avoid doing um, reactions with alkyl halides like this. They just aren't good for the environment. They're not good for the chemists. Okay, so now let's go in to newer chemistry. And the newest chemistry I want to talk about is kind of an offshoot of this, and it's solving this problem with substitutions. And the first one I'm going to show you it's kind of old school. It's not the greatest approach, but it's a step forward. And what you can do is you can have, again, a molecule with the leaving group. So that could be a halogen, it could be a tosylate, something like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to react this with sodium azide. All right. And what this looks like is we have sodium as our cation, and then we've got three nitrogens. Whoops. They should be double bonded. And the central nitrogen has a positive charge. The two side nitrogens have negative charges. And this is a pretty good nucleophile. Normally you see this written as just NaN3 in your book, but I wanted to show you the Lewis structure. And this nitrogen with the negative charge, let me switch colors here, can attack the backside of this carbon and kick off our leaving group. Okay, so when we show this molecule, we now have a compound that looks like this, the positive charge there, and we've got our neutral um, intermediate. Our leaving group is just going to pair with the sodium in fact, I'm just going to ignore that over there. All right, so this is a pretty versatile intermediate. One cool thing you can do with this is you can just treat this with hydrogen and palladium on carbon, and you can reduce the single bonds. This whole chunk right here is going to be lost, and what you're going to be left with is a primary amine. So you can see the previous method I showed with SN2 chemistry was uncontrollable. This one's a lot more controllable. It won't over 
um, react and we are able to get something like our primary mean and nitrogen gas is kicked off. All right, the next one is kind of similar. So I'm gonna shoot, show you this in a different color. And this is using uh, lithium aluminum hydride. So if you use lithium aluminum hydride in step one, followed by water, you can basically do the same sort of reductive chemistry. So it just depends on what reagents you have available and what other functional groups you have in your molecule. So for example, this method right here works really well if you maybe don't have access to uh, a hydrogen tank and a par shaker. Um, however, this one would work well if you had other carbonyl groups in your compound that you didn't want to inadvertently reduce with LAH. All right, now the problem with this one <laughs> is the lethal dose of sodium azide is something like half a gram. So this stuff is explosive and toxic. So it's not the greatest approach, but it solved initially that substitution problem um, where we said with methyl iodide, we can't stop at a primary amine. This allows us to stop at a primary amine. So that's pretty helpful. A better method that was developed later was called the Gabriel synthesis. And the Gabriel synthesis is far less toxic. However, the atom economy is quite poor. So let's take a look at the Gabriel synthesis. And the starting material in the Gabriel synthesis is this bicyclic aromatic molecule. And this starting material is called thalamid. It's commercially available, it's cheap, it's um, easy to find. And all you need to do in the first step is you need to treat it with sodium hydroxide. And you can imagine the most acidic proton and thalamid is gonna be this hydrogen right here. Because if we pluck that off, we get a conjugate base where the negative charge can delocalize either to the top oxygen or the bottom oxygen. It's kind of like the alpha carbon chemistry that we saw before. All right, once you form that negative charge, we can do SN2 chemistry with an alkyl halide. This one won't run out of control. It'll just do it once. And then in step three, we need to kind of kick off the thalamid and leave the nitrogen behind. And you can do this using either acid. This is kind of slow, so I'm just gonna make a note here, but it works. Or if you're in a hurry, you can react this with hydrazine. And this reaction with hydrazine happens much faster due to the uh, more nucleophilic nature of the nitrogens in hydrazine. All right, and when you do this, what you're gonna get is the nitrogen from your thalamid bonded to the R group in your alkyl halide. So this is going to be your main target product if you're wondering what happens to the rest of the thalamid, well, it becomes a byproduct. And in this case, if you use acid, what you get is a dicarboxylic acid, somewhat inert. And I'll make a note that this is if H3O plus is used. If you use hydrazine, you get a different byproduct, but it looks fairly similar. Instead of getting a carboxylic acid, what you're gonna get is you're gonna get an amide. But in this case, you're actually going to form a new ring system here. And this is if, let me move this down. And that's if hydrazine is used. Primarily though, what I'm gonna be concerned with is you showing me um, formation of the amine and then um, the hydrolysis mechanism in step three. So let's take a look at the mechanism here. And we'll look at this in more detail. Like I said, thalamid is commercially available. It's cheap, it's easy to find and the hydrogen coming off of the nitrogen is relatively acidic. So if we have hydroxide, 
hydroxide strong enough to deprotonate that hydrogen. This gives us a nucleophilic conjugate base where the resulting nitrogen has a negative charge. All right, if we have a negative charge on that nitrogen, then all we need to do is react this with an unhindered alkyl halide. And let's make a note here that this should be unhindered. So it should be a primary or a methyl alkyl halide. And then we can do SN2 chemistry where we kick off our leaving group. And form a new nitrogen carbon bond. All right, this is our key intermediate. So let's see what happens if we treat this with catalytic acid, or not even catalytic acid, excess acid and water. All right, so if we have this amide around, what we can do next is we can protonate that oxygen. We have water around next, and this water can attack in, kick up electrons. This probably looks fairly familiar to a lot of the chemistry we've seen previously in our carboxylic acid chapter, but I figured it'd be good review. Actually, let's show both of these bonds. And then we're going to do a proton transfer where we move this proton from the water that was just added in over to the nitrogen. All right, this gives the nitrogen a positive charge, meaning it's a good leaving group now. And then we can kick it off, right? Oops. All right, so now we've done the ring opening reaction. We can deprotonate. Get to our neutral intermediate. Let me move this around a little bit. That way we're not super crowded. And we've got our neutral intermediate. Next thing we would do is basically hydrolyze this next. And you kick off your amine. I'm not going to show that again, but I just wanted to briefly review how we can hydrolyze this intermediate um, and go from our amide uh, to a free amine. The amine essentially is acting as the leaving group when we hydrolyze our amide. All right, so we're going to stop right there. When we come back, we're going to look at a new method for pre preparing amines through reductive amination that's much more versatile than all of these.